Today, solar farm economics in the Midwest. Welcome to SolarWorks for Illinois. I'm Tim Montague, your host. Today, my guest is Dr. David Loomis, who is a professor of economics and co-founder of the Center for Renewable Energy at Illinois State University in Bloomington Normal. Dr. Loomis is a professor of economics and he has over 10 years of experience in the renewable energy field. He has performed economic analyses at the county, region, state, and national levels for utility scale wind and solar generation. He has served as a consultant for Clean Line Energy Partners, National, national Renewable Energy Laboratories, State of Illinois, EON, EDF Renewables, Invenergy, Geronimo Energy, and others. He is widely recognized as an expert and has been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes Magazine, Associated Press, and the Chicago Tribune. Welcome to Solar Works for Illinois, Dr. Loomis. Thank you so much, Tim. It was great getting to know you a few years ago as I took an interest to the wind farms that were sprouting all around us here in central Illinois, and you rode that wave and really made a mark for yourself uh, in the wind industry. Now, of course, the tide has shifted, and we have lots of solar, uh, both DG and utility scale, coming into the Midwest. And in particular, I took note of a report you wrote on the Badger Hollow project, but it turns out you're cranking these projects out on a monthly basis now, so we have a lot to talk about. Tell us a little bit about how you got interested in renewable energy and what you do at Illinois State. Well, I first got uh, interested in uh, renewable energy um, really on the wind side. So we would uh, drive home uh, to Philadelphia. I was born and raised in Philadelphia, and as a uh, family would drive back, I would uh, look at these wind turbines that were on uh, the by the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and I'd make my kids stop each time, and I'd take pictures of the wind turbines uh, that were there, and I just thought uh, this was a, a great way as we look um, at uh, creating or generating energy. What, how are we going to do this? And the idea of capturing uh, the wind uh, to generate electricity just um, just amazed me. And so I'd take pictures and uh, things. But um, really, I started out of an interest in energy policy in general. When I came to the university, that was in 1996. Uh, we were just uh, starting as a state to restructure. And uh, I came from a telecommunications background. I had worked 10 years uh, in telecommunications. Came to the university as a brand new um, professor and uh, in charge of a master's degree program in uh, regulatory economics, electricity, natural gas, and telecommunications economics. So the telecom I knew, but it was getting up to speed and energy, and there was all kinds of exciting things happening in uh, 96 around restructuring and how we should uh, design uh, energy markets in Illinois. And so the idea then, uh, as we uh, advance a few years of bringing in uh, wind energy into the state was brand new. And so it was around the year 2000 that I was involved in a couple of my colleagues who were also interested in renewable energy. And we started uh, to talk about designing a renewable energy uh, major at the university and looking for uh, grants and funding to bring that about. And you were successful then in starting this Center for Renewable Energy, uh, and in parallel, you have created a consulting firm, Strategic Economic Research. Tell us about the, uh, the different roles that you play. Yeah, so I started out at the university and uh, under a number of grants, first from the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, and then uh, a state grant to look at the uh, existing jobs that were created uh, from the wind industry, and then also to say, what, what is the future potential? What, what could we have? And so I generated a statewide reports, and it was um, a year or two after that, uh, that first um, uh, Invenergy asked me to say, hey, could you do this on a project-specific basis uh, and look at the impact that will be made at the county and then also at the state level? And then um, Clean Energy um, uh, Partners uh, 
um, they were looking at transmission lines and saying, what's the economic impact that would be brought from a transmission line? And so then it just kind of snowballed from, uh, from there. And uh, that eventually grew into strategic economic uh, research, LLC, kind of the consulting part uh, of what I do. So it, it uh, works well and blends well with the university uh, work now. Uh, keeping on top of trends in renewable energy. I'm uh, going to be uh, teaching uh, a course this fall um, to undergraduate students on environmental and natural resource economics and a regulatory economics class. So trying to keep current on trends uh, and then be able to, to benefit the industry by doing uh, these consulting reports. Well, we're grateful for your work at the university and in the consulting world, those are both very important uh, hats to wear, so to speak. And for any of our listeners who are looking for a career, renewable energy is a wonderful place to find 50 years of peer growth ahead of us. So check out uh, the program at ISU and other resources uh, and directly, you can reach out to me directly and I can help point you in various directions. So utility scale solar, it accounts for about half of the solar installations in the United States on an annual basis. What are some of the national and Midwestern trends for utility scale solar in the US, David? Well, it, it's been a newer development here in the Midwest. Uh, we had written, colleagues and I had written a report talking about the economic uh, potential uh, for uh, solar in Illinois, and we hardly had any solar or solar was not talked about. And I think the perception at the time was that, you know, the solar is something for um, the Southwest, maybe Arizona, uh, New Mexico, Southern California, Florida. Those are all the solar states. And here in the Midwest, um, you know, we're not going to be uh, a solar state, and that has really changed, uh, much to my amazement and and um, uh, enjoyment, uh, that the perception is no solar can go uh, uh, anywhere, uh, and in particular, uh, it's very compatible here in the Midwest, uh, as we have uh, large rural uh, places, and in particular in Illinois, where you have uh, a large load center in the form of. Uh, of Chicago uh, that will consume a lot of uh, electricity. And so uh, a state like Illinois, Wisconsin, and others are perfectly suited uh, for solar. And we've just seen a huge increase in uh, developer interest in coming into the, to the Midwest. And we've seen some of the solar uh, wind, wind developers have changed over and started to look at uh, solar development. And so there's been pure play solar developers, and then there's been kind of the hybrid uh, or changeover from wind uh, into solar. Yeah, I can think of a few names that were already on your resume, Invenergy and Geronimo uh, are good examples, right, of companies that were doing a majority of wind development, but are now uh, that ratio is shifting more towards solar, and both companies are developing utility scale solar in the Midwest, especially in Venergy is, is on my radar. Um, and we'll talk about one of their projects today, which is being developed in Christian County in South Central Illinois, and that's a, a 325 megawatt DC project. Um, do you want to say anything else about that transition or the, the growth of solar versus wind? Yeah, the, you can look at, at uh, these growth trends. And I think, um, you know, uh, w one of the big issues that we'll get into uh, later is the compatibility with the agriculture community. I think we've uh, seen from the get-go that um, wind uh, was very compatible uh, with farming because it took uh, a, a particular turbine took so little uh, land area out of um, use uh, for farming typically just um, you know about an acre when you consider both the base uh, of a turbine uh, in those access roads and so um, it's been an adjustment as we've looked at solar where you're taking uh, whole farms multiple farms uh, out of farming 
and going to use those uh, for solar panels. And so uh, it, it really is a changeover. And I think that's a shock a little bit to, to some in the ag community um, and uh, a reason for um, liking wind a little bit more because uh, especially uh, as you look at other forms of development, if you do a wind farm, you're going to keep that, um, that uh, surrounding area in agricultural use. And I think the concern is what, what's going to happen uh, if we move uh, uh, towards solar. So there's some concerns, I think, in the ag community, um, you know, uh, with solar. Uh, but then I think there's less concerns uh, as far as property values and, and um, uh, birds and bats and environmental concerns. So, so there's always trade-offs. Yeah, wind and solar are apples and oranges, as you've mentioned. When you develop wind, you're not taking so much of the land out of rotation, uh, which is a plus. But frankly, wind has a lot of NIMBY issues. Uh, I see here in my own county, which created a very restrictive wind ordinance, basically to prevent wind from coming into Champaign County. And that's because of the visual impact, the lights, the noise from the turbines themselves, the flicker, um, which is a shadow impact of mm -hmm. sunlight bouncing off the moving turbines. And while I'm a big fan of wind energy, and it is very much a both end in terms of the energy transition, we need more of both wind and solar and uh, battery storage now that that's economical. And, uh, but I'm happy to be involved in the development of solar projects. I think developing solar is easier. I think it is less impactful. Uh, from a visual and noise perspective. And it is a change though. And I've, I've witnessed uh, some of the objections that farming communities have to solar. And I think that while it is different, taking what is corn and beans and putting it into an industrial use like solar, there are a lot of benefits uh, from a strictly ecological and land use perspective, you're taking what is heavily uh, mechanized and chemicalized farming, you know, with lots of chemical inputs and turning it into potentially an, orga an organic field with uh, steel piles driven into it. And after 25 years of being a solar farm, you have really fertile, uh, lovely farmland. Um, so it is a flexible form of development. We're not taking the land out of development forever. You could always return a solar farm or even a wind farm, of course, and, and the farms continue around the wind farms. But for solar, it will mean less farming. Uh, I am doing a series on agriculture and, so and solar and pollinator friendly solar. So there are some dual uses for solar farms that we will be exploring here on the channel and the show. So let's uh, give us a high level on what is it that you do? Uh, as far as the consulting side or the uh, academic side? Yeah, on, on um, the type of economic analysis that you do of these solar projects. Yeah, so I'd say there's there's three parts uh, typically to the report that I um, put through, and and I uh, say um, this that uh, as I've gone to to permitting hearings, almost all the time developers will have people uh, come uh, as expert witnesses, and almost always those expert witnesses are on the defensive. There's um, there's a sound expert that's going to talk about uh, the project being below uh, the noise limits. Uh, there's a, you know, a property value expert and a, um, an assessor that's saying that uh, this is not going to affect your property value. So most of the witnesses are say, uh, addressing community concerns and assuring the community that the bad things that they're thinking uh, are going to happen, really are not going to happen as a result of this project. 
And I think what uh, sets apart the work that I uh, do is that these are the positive benefits that are going to come to a community. And they're flowing not just to the individual um, uh, landowner uh, that's going to lease their land or sell their land for a project. This is really looking at what are the benefits that are going to come uh, to the entire community. And so I look at the economic uh, impacts. Uh, so this would be job creation, and that's important uh, to uh, community, and especially in areas where these are getting built uh, are uh, typically in counties that have, uh, are rural, don't have a lot of opportunities for this uh, size of economic development project. Uh, and so maybe because they have a transmission line that has capacity, they have a resource that sets them apart from uh, other communities. Uh, and so they can look at uh, the jobs that will come to, to the community. Uh, it will look at, the, uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing would be to really look at the, uh, the property taxes. So I do a detailed analysis. Uh, of the property taxes that will flow uh, to a community, both, uh, you know, the county, the township, school districts take more than 50% of the property taxes, at least here in Illinois. And so we talk about, you know, the money that will go to uh, local schools, which uh, are uh, definitely hurting for funding. And so these could make a, a real difference to a school district in terms of retaining teachers that they might otherwise have to let go. Uh, and then uh, the third analysis is something that I've more recently uh, done, and Badger Hollow was the first time that I uh, did this analysis, was really looking at uh, land use analysis because that was getting a lot of attention. Uh, where community, or especially uh, those in the ag community, are saying, um, uh, we, we, we don't want this land um, uh, developed. We don't want this land uh, removed uh, from agriculture. And I think one of the reassuring uh, points that you made earlier is that this is only being removed from uh, agriculture for a limited amount of time. Now, 30 years might, 25, 30 years might seem like a long time uh, to uh, others, but really in terms of agriculture, that's not uh, a huge amount of time. And then typically in a solar ordinance um, and, and or in the leases, it's required for the developer to restore this land back to its original condition. So they have to remove uh, all of the, you know, um, uh, uh, all of the racking, all the panels, uh, all of the uh, materials down uh, typically to, to four feet. Uh, below uh, the surface. And so it's going to revert back to farmland. And then at that point, at the end of the lease, 25, 30 years, uh, that uh, landowner would have the opportunity to return it uh, to farming. Uh, so if the conditions have improved over that 25, 30 years, it might get repowered. Uh, there may be a better technology uh, out there. And we've started to see that on the wind side. Uh, so as you're looking at long-term trends, you might see that repowered or the, there's just an open opportunity. And so you're just really saying we're going to take this particular land out of productive use of land for this given period of time. And I think um, we do this uh, for federal programs to help support agriculture. Uh, uh, CRP programs and others will actually pay to take land uh, out of production. In a certain sense, uh, solar is doing that same thing. We're paying for a limited period of time to take that land out of production so that it can be used for, uh, for solar. Uh, and so in the analysis, we take a look at what is uh, the ret economic return to farming and what is it likely to be over the next 25, 30 years? With all the uncertainty as far as uh, weather and what yields are going to be, certainly the volatility that we've seen in prices of corn and soybeans. So I take all that into account and compare it to a, a solar lease or, or in some cases uh, developers are buying the land, but most often uh, it's leased. And so we do that comparison uh, for the landowner and say what's the best uh, economic use of this land. Indeed. 
we think of the upper Midwest as the breadbasket of America. How does solar energy compare and contrast with corn and bean farming? Yeah, so in the analysis that I have uh, done, um, solar uh, uh, has been a much better um, use of a particular uh, land area. So developers are not indiscriminately just uh, taking out um, uh, farms, but they're looking at particular areas that may be nearby to a transmission line and interconnection point uh, that they can put uh, that power onto the grid. Uh, and so that particular farm becomes much more valuable for solar than for farming. And there may be the opportunity to shift some of that uh, farming uh, to another uh, area within the county that doesn't um, have that close proximity to a transmission line. So we wanna say, what is the, um, the value um, of that particular uh, parcel of land and what is its uh, best use? And what I found in doing the analysis and doing the simulations uh, is that almost hands down, uh, it, uh, solar is uh, the better economic use of the land because you're, uh, you've got the uncertainty in terms of prices and yields. And in my experience, uh, prices would have to uh, double uh, or almost triple uh, in value over 25, 30 years. And while we've seen volatility, uh, in there uh, for prices, we haven't seen that order of magnitude uh, uh, increase. And so it's a much more valuable use of the land to use solar. The thing to keep in mind for farming communities is that we are not going to pave over the breadbasket. We are going to take a fraction of a percent or maybe, maybe one to 2% at most of our rural lands and convert them to solar farms. So it's a, it's a very small fraction of the land. And um, in layman's terms, one of the ways to think about the economics of solar in particular are that today for prime farm ground in central Illinois, which is some of the best farm ground in the world, bar none, a farmer can make $300 an acre in rent if they wanna rent their land for bean, beans and corn. And a solar farmer or a solar developer will lease that land for at least $600 an acre and perhaps as high as $1,200 an acre. So a farmer can quickly double or triple their income from their land. And of course, that's gonna have trickle down effects and indirect economic impacts as well. As far as measuring the economic impacts of solar farms, you use a tool called JEDI, J-E-D-I. Tell us what that is. So JEDI stands for Jobs and Economic Development Impacts. Uh, I think somebody was uh, a Star Wars fan uh, when they uh, put the acronym uh, together in that room, but uh, the JEDI model uh, basically uh, is developed by NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratories uh, out in Go Golden, Colorado. And um, they put together this tool to measure the economic impacts. Uh, and there's some built-in um, measurements in there, kind of average cost of a system, um, multipliers typically at the state. Uh, and uh, I don't use any of that built-in information. Really, I use that tool as a translation tool to say, let's look at the, co the, the cost of uh, a solar development. So I get detailed uh, budget numbers under uh, pro forma from the developer to say, what are your estimates of how much you're gonna spend on panels and how much installation labor is going to be and, um, and things. And what JEDI enables me to do is to translate that information, budget information that a developer might have into economic sectors uh, that an e economic impact analysis can, can use. Uh, so it's a translation tool to say, oh, when we're talking about um, a permitting costs, typically that involves these types of industries. Uh, in this proportion. And so uh, then I take 
county specific multipliers. And these are from software called Implan. Uh, it's a company that uh, is widely recognized. It's one of, of uh, the two main uh, tools that economic developers would use to measure economic development uh, impacts of anything like building a new hospital or uh, what we did it for Illinois State University. What's the economic impact of the university to the local community. So we take those local economic multipliers and we take brand new state economic multipliers, the latest available, and kind of mesh those two together. Here's what they're going to spend on the one side. Uh, here's the local community, uh, uh, what, the, what the economy seems like in the local economy as measured by Implan. Put those two together to, to get uh, and develop those economic impacts. When I think of solar development, I think of jobs. That is the number one impact that I think of. But there are a variety of direct and indirect economic benefits of solar development. Let's break down some of what those are uh, over the life cycle of a solar farm development from development permitting to engineering, procurement, construction, and then operations and maintenance. Um, and then decommissioning or repowering. What are the direct and indirect economic benefits? Yeah, so just a little bit of, of uh, definition. When we're talking about a direct um, you know, economic uh, benefit, a direct job to a community, we're really looking at those jobs uh, that are gonna be on site and uh, building the project. So during construction, uh, the direct jobs would be uh, considering, you know, the construction workers, uh, engineers, and others that are going to be uh, building uh, the solar farm. When we're talking about uh, operations and maintenance, the direct jobs would be the solar technicians that are going to be um, uh, doing uh, maintenance uh, and repairs on, uh, you know, any of the solar panels that uh, go out of service uh, or any problems they have with uh, inverters, transformers, et cetera. And so that's the jobs that are visible. Those are the ones that we can see, but uh, oftentimes uh, people uh, stop there and don't look at the indirect benefits. Indirect benefits deal with the um, uh, supply chain. So we say, if we build uh, this project, not only is it going to have a direct impact, but there's going to be uh, necessary inputs into that. And oftentimes those can only get uh, bill, you know, purchased uh, locally just due um, to the um, shipping costs of bringing it from uh, afar. So uh, there would be uh, impacts for all of the uh, uh, materials uh, that are used to build uh, that solar farm. Those would be in those indirect uh, benefits. Um, so think of supply chain. Now, um, typically with uh, solar panels, many of the projects that I've worked on, uh, they're importing those uh, solar panels from overseas. And so that's not gonna be an economic impact uh, to the local community. But unless you had um, some uh, manufacturer, uh, and we do have manufacturers here uh, in the states, but unless it happened to be in the local community or the state of interest that you're building in, uh, those aren't going to be uh, an economic impact. But if you think about uh, all the pilings, uh, putting in uh, concrete to secure uh, the racking, racking may come uh, um, uh, locally or at least uh, from the state. Uh, certainly construction um, labor is going to come uh, locally or at least uh, from around the state. So those are all the jobs that would be created. And then a third category is what we call induced jobs. Induced jobs are those um, jobs that are supported from people having more uh, income. So those would be uh, jobs uh, at the grocery store, at the movie theater, when we are able to go to movie theaters again, um, and uh, dining out, grocery stores, uh, retail. Um, those tend to be uh, uh, lower average wage jobs, but those are also uh, an impact uh, to the local community. So those are the three, the direct, indirect supply chain jobs and uh, induced jobs. 
And do you want to say anything about the strengths and shortcomings of Jedi before we get into some of the economics of, of these three projects that you've looked at recently? Yeah, uh, so uh, Jedi um, it has limitations. Uh, it's only taking um, uh, a, a snapshot in time. Um, and so if we um, wanted to, you know, analyze uh, trends over many years, um, it would, um, there may be other tools that would be better suited to this. Uh, also, some of the built-in information become Uh, because the costs keep getting, um, you know, reduced over time for solar, we've seen wonderful uh, cost uh, reductions uh, in solar uh, over time. Uh, sometimes the JEDI model doesn't keep uh, pace uh, with that, so it would overestimate the cost uh, of a project if you use the built-in kind of average cost. Uh, that, that's there and may not have anticipated uh, the cost declines. Uh, and then the built-in multipliers also quickly become uh, out of date. So I've tried to overcome those limitations by using actual, you know, cost data from the developer and uh, actual uh, economic multipliers from in-plan with that are the latest available and then just uh, you simply use the JEDI as a translation tool. Got it. So shall we discuss some of these specific projects? Uh, I'm aware of three in particular, Badger Hollow, Badger State, and then Hickory Point. The first two being in Southern Wisconsin in the Madison area and then Hickory Point being in Christian County. Yeah. What are some of the highlights uh, and economic, economic impacts in terms of jobs, earnings, and taxes for these counties? Yeah, yeah, so uh, Badger um, Hollow was uh, the first one um, that uh, I had done in Wisconsin, and uh, this was uh, before the Wisconsin uh, Public Service Commission. They have a permitting uh, process, uh, at least of these size projects that have to go through the Public Service uh, Commission. So it's a more uh, formal uh, process, but we estimated uh, that it would bring to Iowa County where the project is actually now under construction. So it passed permitting, it's um, currently under construction. We estimated that Iowa County would see a total of uh, 422 jobs. Those would consist of 190 jobs uh, during project development and on-site uh, labor impacts, so that direct jobs. Uh, 181 would be the uh, supply chain or indirect uh, jobs, and then an additional 51 jobs um, that are those induced jobs, uh, you know, retail, grocery stores, movie theater jobs, uh, et cetera. So that's how it breaks down for a total of uh, 422. Now that's during construction. Those are one-time jobs and oftentimes people uh, belittle those jobs um, in some ways to say, oh, well, they're temporary jobs. They're going away. But I think it's important and I've heard a lot of uh, union workers say this at hearings is that their jobs aren't uh, are, are permanent jobs, they just move from temporary project to temporary project. So they are construction workers, and by definition, they're moving on from project to project. So they need lots of these uh, to continue to be fully employed, and the labor unions do that successfully. So it's not to belittle these, uh, it's just to say that these are going to, um, and we've normalized these for full full-time equivalents, so that would be um, 2,080 hours per year. So some of these might be part-time, but we don't, we count that as a fraction of a job. And these are going to be lasting for uh, 12 months. So you could think of it as 422 uh, job years. When, and that's in just in Iowa County. Um, there, um, when we look at the state of Wisconsin, uh, that's going to have uh, a, a slightly bigger impact, um, and those totals are 500 jobs. When we look at operations, so these are the long-term ongoing jobs, you would see 
Uh, five jobs, uh, those are solar uh, technician jobs that are going to be working on site. Uh, another 8.7 jobs would be uh, local revenue and supply chain impacts. That would include the property tax uh, revenue and impacts that would come, as well as the landowner lease payments that are going to be coming year after year. So those get in uh, those indirect jobs, and that's 8.7 jobs. Uh, and then the induced impacts are 3.2 jobs for a total of almost 16.9 uh, or 17 jobs uh, will be uh, continuing and long lasting for the life of the project 25, 30 year uh, time horizon. Got it, so you're always calling out just for, for those who look at these reports. And if you just Google, for example, Badger Hollow Solar, you'll, you'll find David's report and you always break out the county and the state. The state figures are inclusive of those county figures, just for clarification. That's correct. I, I run actually two separate models, one using the county multipliers and a separate one using the state multipliers. So there, there are two separate models, but obviously the state impacts um, uh, being uh, inclusive of the county uh, would always be um, higher or under most normal conditions would be higher than the county impacts. So we're talking about a 400 megawatt DC solar array. It's 3,500 acres for all intents and purposes. We're talking about 900, uh, no, sorry, 500 construction jobs and 31 long-term permanent jobs for the state of Wisconsin. So yeah. this is a very uh, positive thing. And nationally, of course, we have about a quarter of a million people working in the solar industry now nationally. So this means real economic impact on both a local, state, and national level. What are some of the other economic impacts of, of these projects? So we also measured uh, property taxes. Now in, in Wisconsin, um, uh, generators are exempt uh, from uh, local property taxes, but they um, uh, pay into uh, a utility aid fund uh, at the state level. And, and then those funds then are, uh, you know, uh, given to the county and the townships on a megawatt of uh, capacity basis that would flow. So I also calculated uh, those for, um, that, you know, that will go to the county and the township. Uh, in, and in that case, it helps, um, you know, lessen the blow of the tax exempt nature of electric generators. But I will note that that's not just for solar, that's uh, any, uh, generator. So that would be the same for, for wind, a coal plant, a natural gas plant. Um, any generator uh, is property tax exempt and then uh, they um, pay into the state fund and then it flows uh, to the local area. And that's in great contrast to the way that we do it here in Illinois. And actually the economic impacts and the property taxes are, are higher in Illinois than they are in Wisconsin. I don't want to minimize uh, those funds that will uh, flow in Wisconsin, but uh, it is a kind of selling point in Illinois to do a utility scale project that those property tax revenues will be uh, a big lift to local communities. Yeah, and maybe we should just dive into some of those with Hickory Point. So Invenergy is developing a 325 megawatt DC project in Christian County here in central Illinois. Give us the, give us the highlights on Hickory Point. Yeah, so Hickory Point, and again, um, people will oftentimes say, well, you know, why can't we just borrow from one study uh, to another? Why do we have to do a um, project specific one? And, and there's, two reasons I would give to that, because sometimes, you know, people would give general ranges of here's how many jobs it will create and so forth. And I think the value of having a specific one is that it really uh, varies quite a bit 
depending on the local economy and depending on how much uh, the developer is planning on spending locally, whether they have a very conscious effort to uh, spend in the local economy, that can make uh, a huge difference in these um, estimates. So for example, um, Hickory Point, uh, uh, lumping all those uh, together that we talked about before is estimated to have 752 jobs created or supported um, during construction. And so um, the, you see that it's um, a, a bigger impact uh, here for, um, uh, for Christian County than it was. And we see uh, a, over 1,100 jobs created for the state of Illinois. So the numbers are very specific uh, to uh, projects. And I think it does a disservice just to give an average number uh, or even a range because those ranges can be uh, quite a bit. And so in my experience, even for the same company, these are both in Benergy projects, uh, they are um, uh, quite a bit different. And then it's 12.8 uh, uh, um, jobs uh, during uh, operations. So uh, again, we're seeing in that same uh, a ballpark, uh, but less on the supply chain side than what we saw uh, at the Badger Hollow. So that's the value in, in doing these. But I, I think the, the big contrast is in the uh, property taxes uh, that come. So, and, and I've seen a lot of uh, local folks, um, you know, look at this um, because this is kind of the, what's in it for me. I, you know, if I'm not a, Landowner, I'm not leasing this land. How do I get benefit? Well, uh, in the Hickory Point uh, analysis, we looked at each individual taxing entity. So, for example, Christian County is expected to get $154,000 uh, uh, each year. Now, in the provision of the law, they do allow for depreciation, but then that bottoms out. It doesn't go all the way to zero. And then there's a trending factor that looks at inflation. So it, it, um, uh, it rises again. But over um, the 30 year period here, you're looking at over $3 million coming to, the, uh, to Christian County, the county uh, as a taxing entity. Um, here, uh, townships get uh, South Fork, Fork Township gets close to 600,000. Uh, Bear Creek Township gets 250,000, uh, with a really big winner in Illinois from utility scale solar projects uh, are school districts. We um, have Morrisville School District getting $463,000 every year. That would total over $9.2 million over the life of the project. Taylorville School District is going to get $6.2 million and uh, Pawnee School District, $2.7 million. So those um, are large sums for small, you know, rural school districts. And oftentimes I'm talking with school superintendents who are trying to puzzle over, are we really gonna get that money? We heard from the developer, walk me through the, the how you calculated these. And, um, uh, and things. So I've done that. And then school superintendents are definitely on board to really uh, be an advocate and see these projects built. And um, one of the things that I've um, been raised uh, with taxes in Illinois, um, some opponents have said, well, you get that money, but then the state takes some money uh, away in the form of general state aid that school districts get from uh, from the state. And uh, that used to be true, although the orders of magnitude are very, very small. So you get a lot of money and, and very little clawback from the state. Uh, they changed the formula, uh, the school funding formula, and that's no longer the case. There's a whole harmless provision. So you never get less than what you did last um, in the previous year. So there's no reduction to school districts when a utility scale solar project uh, moves into an area. And then what happens at the end of life? If, if the 
facility is decommissioned, do, is there then a hole in the budget or how does, how does that work? That is an excellent point and one uh, that we made um, on the wind side, my co-author um, Matt Aldman and I uh, wrote a report uh, on um, wind farms. The way uh, things work uh, in the, the property taxes and mechanisms is you're paying property taxes uh, in, uh, in arrears uh, and if a new development comes into a local community, that's not reported, that wealth, that newfound wealth of a community isn't reported to the state until the next year. And then the school district allocation comes the year after that. So actually on the front end, you make out really, really well because you've got the local taxing money coming in and the, uh, Springfield hasn't realized that you have this additional money coming in. So you get the, the same payments that you were uh, uh, getting uh, without that additional wealth. Where that comes to bite you is at the end of the life of the project, uh, according to the school district formula, they think that you still have this wealth because it hasn't rolled off of the, the, um, uh, the tax rolls in their mind, but really you, it did, it got decommissioned and you're not getting any tax revenue. So at the end of life, you're going to, um, uh, have a, de uh, a hole in your budget. So we strongly advocated in the report uh, that um, firms take this into account, have a rainy day fund with kind of the extra money that they got at the beginning uh, and uh, fund that. I'm not sure that anybody is in a position to save something for 30 years. So I think it's fallen on deaf uh, ears. But the good news is at the beginning of the project, it's, it's not fully depreciated. And so you're, the extra money that you're getting up front is way, way bigger than the budget hole that you'll have when the project is fully depreciated at the end of that 30 years. The other thing that's present for me about this is that you are taking cropland out of rotation. So let me play devil's advocate here. Are you accounting for the lost revenue both in terms of jobs and tax income when land is converted from cropping to, in this case, solar farming? Yeah, that's an excellent point. And, and um, uh, I've done it uh, both ways. So uh, typically the numbers that I uh, report are uh, gross economic impacts where we say this is, this is the economic impact of the solar project. But you're right, in terms of doing a net uh, economic impact, that land will be taken out of use. And so uh, if we take the uh, productive value of that land and say it's going to, to shrink the uh, ag community, let's take a look at the reduction uh, in agriculture and the reduction in the supply chain to agriculture. So all those support services you know, uh, seed, fertilizer, uh, et cetera, um, those businesses uh, will be impacted in uh, the local area. And so uh, I've done those net analyses a, a number of times, not every time, but if there's a particular concern in the ag community, I'll net uh, those out. And every time I've done that, it's always been a, a net positive. Um, so there's still a positive economic impact, even after netting out the agriculture impacts. And that's where I take the maximum agriculture impacts. So I said before, you can take and say, I'm not going to farm this land, but it may be the opportunity to take uh, other land in the county uh, and farm that land instead. So the particular one for the solar project maybe near, needs to be near the transmission line, but it might not be the most uh, fertile farmland. Now it could, but there's the opportunity to farm elsewhere in the county. So I don't think a landowner or the farmer has to say, well, I'm forever giving up farming. You're just trading one land for another. And in that case, if they're just moving the land that they're farming, uh, we may not see that full economic uh, impact decrease from uh, the ag community. So I tried to make the maximum um, impact uh, in solar still comes out way, way better. Great. 
I want to circle back to something you said, comparing and contrasting Badger Hollow to Hickory Point. If I if I heard correctly, there were five there were five hundred jobs, uh, short term jobs for Badger Hollow for the state of Wisconsin, and there were eleven hundred for the state of Illinois for the Hickory Point project. These projects are similar in scale, though. What is it that causes those differences? Yeah, so there's uh, two things that are going to cause uh, the differences there. One is what the developer thinks they're going to spend uh, in the state. Um, and one of the things that um, is always concerning is if you have a project that is right by the state border, it is possible that uh, some of that economic impact leaks across the border. So if you're in a county that's at a border state, um, some of those jobs uh, for uh, Badger Hollow might flow into Illinois. And so we will typically uh, lower uh, the percentage spend uh, in state uh, if it's a county that's uh, bordering on another state. If you look at Christian County, it's kind of right at the heart uh, of Illinois. And so the idea of bringing in, you know, uh, construction workers, say from, you know, from Iowa or, um, you know, Missouri, um, probably not going to happen uh, with, with that size commute. But it could if you're just one county uh, away. So we'll lower that estimate um, to be more conservative. Uh, and then the second thing is those economic multipliers. And it's the economic multipliers in the specific industries that um, we're looking at that um, solar uses. And so uh, Illinois has a very good economic multiplier in many of the, the areas, uh, the economic sectors uh, that source um, uh, materials uh, and workers for solar projects. And so uh, it's one of the things that I like from, you know, doing my home state uh, analysis is those economic multipliers are really high for Illinois. So if you spend a dollar in Illinois, what's that saying in, in this particular sector is that it's going to reverberate throughout the Illinois uh, economy uh, and more of that economic uh, development impact will be retained uh, by the state. Now, much of that is caused by the fact that we have Chicago and the border uh, counties uh, that have a lot of uh, manufacturing. We have a well-developed uh, economy here in the state. So even though you're doing it in a rural county that might be downstate, you benefit from having Chicago and those border counties within the state and the economic impacts are, are just much higher for the state. Got it. That's very interesting and not necessarily intuitive. So yeah. readers have to keep these uh, these nitty gritty details in mind. I want to circle back to land use implications in the last few minutes that we have together, David. As we've mentioned earlier in the show, you know, converting land to solar farms is a change for these rural communities, and it, there are. Uh, arguments for and arguments against this change. But the bottom line is that we are adding 15 gigawatts now of solar a year in the United States. We have a tremendous demand for new power generating facilities. And so these facilities, like it or not, are coming to the Midwest. It's just the economic forces are pushing the agenda, so to speak. Now, today, you have land that's being cropped for cash crops like corn and beans, compared to tomorrow, for a small percentage of the land, we're just talking about 1% of the landscape. But what what is the change and, and how can farmers think about the the benefits? What is the upside? And how would crop prices and yields have to change in order for them to stay on an equal footing, so to speak, with solar? Yeah, it, it is uh, tough, I know, for a lot of um, 
you know, family farms uh, that have uh, weathered uh, the, you know, uh, difficulties that agriculture's had uh, over the many years and uh, uh, decades, that they're constantly in this struggle and battle for, um, you know, uh, to say, making decisions. Do I plant all corn, uh, soybeans? We're having trade wars the, uh, with China that is um, uh, affecting those markets. So there's a lot of volatility in uh, those prices. Uh, and then in yields, because we, you know, especially this year, we had a very wet um, uh, spring and some plant, you know, some fields had to be replanted that uh, has extra costs. I think the, the uh, you noted that uh, in some of those uh, lease costs, you could get um, double or sometimes triple uh, the, your cash rent price if you uh, lease the land. And I think the thing that goes along with that is that those payments are certain. You, you only have the, the credit risk of the, uh, of the solar developer and I haven't seen uh, any defaults on that uh, side. And besides, somebody's going to be operating that uh, solar farm. And so you have that certainty. Uh, it usually involves some type of um, escalator for inflation so that you don't, um, you get some you know, inflation adjustment uh, over the years. And th those are certain payments. And what I've seen people, is, I think some people think it's an all or nothing decision. Oh, I'm getting out of farming uh, altogether. And it doesn't, it can be that way if you're ready to retire and, and uh, have a simpler lifestyle, but it doesn't have to be that way. This particular land is valuable for this particular project. But if you have the flexibility to then farm elsewhere, it just means a shifting of your farming operations and then those fixed payments that are certain can go to pay, say, for your property taxes on all the land that you own because those are fixed payments. Or it could go to pay for your uh, seed and fertilizer. And I think it's that non-volatility of those lease payments as well as the size of those lease payments that are very attractive and, and make solar a very compatible use with the ag uh, community. Indeed, that's the mantra I like to repeat, that these uses are compatible with rural communities. We're not trying to tell farmers to stop farming. We're asking them to consider using a fraction of their land for a different, in this case, higher use which is not going to harm the land. You can convert the land back to farm ground. It'll actually be more valuable if you treat the land well while it is a solar farm. You don't have to use pesticides on a solar farm. If you plant native prairie plants, for example, and get them established, they will keep the weeds down. And so then you can have organic farm ground after 25 years of solar farm. So what do you say in a nutshell to local authorities. These county boards are sometimes drinking from a fire hose because solar is relatively new in the Midwest and it's a lot to take in. But these, uh, these, these boards and committees like Zoning Boards of Appeals is the, the board that we have here in Illinois are very influential what do you say to these stakeholders about how solar will impact their community? Well, I do think, uh, and going back to our earlier conversation about wind, is you, uh, solar has the advantage of not having the visual impacts uh, that the uh, wind uh, will have. And so the number of uh, people that are affected uh, by uh, a solar farm coming in, directly affected on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, tends to be a much smaller group. It will be, tend to be the uh, adjacent landowners uh, to a project. And even then, uh, the impacts uh, are very, very small. You're not going to have very much in the way of, uh, of noise, environmental impacts, um, uh, no property value impacts. And so I think um, for 
uh, those uh, zoning board of appeals. You're right. It, it is, it's very technical. The reports get very technical. Even my report, I try and uh, write it to a general audience, but I understand that economics was not the favorite subject of most students when they were going through uh, college. And so it, it gets quite um, technical. But I, I think uh, the value in looking uh, through and having uh, those reports and experts is to assure uh, those decision makers that there's not going to be a detrimental impact uh, to uh, their community and even uh, uh, adjacent landowners, that this is a very um, uh, good use of the land, although alternative to what they had seen in terms of farming, but a very compatible uh, use. Uh, so it, it's a tough job. Um, when we had our Center for Renewable Energy, we did uh, zoning um, uh, uh, conferences for county officials just to get them up to speed um, on these complex issues so that they knew the terminology, they knew the right questions to ask and so forth. So I don't envy them uh, having to, to go through this. Uh, but from what I've seen of many developers that are very conscientious, um, want to um, do things uh, in the community uh, and to be a part of the community. And so I think that's been, um, you know, made their job uh, easier to give them the information that they really need. Well, we're about out of time. I want to remind our listeners that they can find all of our upcoming programming at cesnrg.com forward slash podcast. Check us out on YouTube. Please subscribe to our channel. Give us a thumbs up. I will put references to the three reports that Dr. David Loomis has written on Badger Hollow, Badger State, and Hickory Point Solar Farms. How can our listeners reach you, Dr. Loomis? Uh, they can reach me. Um, my consulting address is uh, uh, Dave at Strategic Economic, all one word, dot com. Uh, they can always use my university email address is dloomis at ilstu dot edu, or they can Google me and I'm happy um, to have conversations um, with folks about the materials that we've talked about today. Wonderful. Well, there we have it. I'm Tim Montague, your host. Thank you for listening to Solar Works for Illinois. Solar Farm Economics in the Midwest with Dr. David Loomis. Let's grow solar. <laughs>